Let me tell you what my deep research and basically vision is. I hope there's Bigfoot. I don't think there is. I'm not telling you nothing. <laughs> the aliens won't way. let it happen. <laughs> Happening now, breaking. And Bernie Sanders is a bear beats Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> what are the tips? Give me some tips on how to work with Wes Anderson. Um, be ready to speak very fast and very <laughs> clearly because that's definitely one key thing. Until you and six kids you barely know in wet bathing suits have surrounded nine chimpanzees outside of a Wendy's, you probably really don't know yourself, okay? Yep. And we back. Hello and welcome. You're listening to your new favorite podcast and the best in political sports and paranormal news coverage. I'm your host, Wes Anderson, and this is In the Shed. This is episode 10, so whether you're back for more or finding us for the first time this week, hey, thanks for tuning in. It's late Friday night, March 26th, and I am in a shed in the backyard of my home in Alabama just so I can hang out with you tools and talk about the latest headlines, stories, and rumors in the world of politics, sports, and the paranormal. We did it, my tools. Episode 10. Meemaw, we made it. Big congrats to us. That's right. I am congratulating us, as in all of us. The nation of India, France, Australia, the UK, Greece, all of my tools stateside. I appreciate the heck out of you for sticking with me, for listening. Uh, I'm still new to this, and I'm just a random guy in a shed with a microphone, a computer, and a 50-foot extension cord. There is nothing special about me, but there is something special about this show, and it's you. It's you, my tools, my people, my babies. I can't wait to see what things are like for us on episode 100 and how we've grown. So keep sharing the show with your family, your friends, and uh, we'll continue to grow this thing together. Uh, Tonight is a big night for us, a big show, not just because it's our 10th episode, but also because for the first time ever, we have some guests with us tonight. Live in the shed, hanging out, reacting to tonight's news stories with us, we have some guests. I've been wanting to have a guest or two on the show since we started, but since we have no advertisers yet, no budget yet, and little connections, and I'm just a guy in the shed after all, our options are a bit limited. In order to have a guest on the show, we would have to find someone willing to come on for free, someone willing to record an episode late at night in a shed. So I thought, who are two people that I know who share an interest in the kinds of things that we talk about on this show and who I would enjoy talking to. So tonight, our guests are two of my favorite people, uh, my younger and much cooler sister, Bethany, and her husband, Russell. Bethany and Russell, welcome to the shed tonight. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. We're visiting from the city of Calera, Alabama, and we're here to provide the best free entertainment south of the Mississippi. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> Russell likes that too. Russell, uh, what do you think of the shed? I love the shed. Um, it's a shed. Yeah, it it's, is. You know, it's, it's a nice shed. Though. So you guys, for people, I've had a couple emails. People have sent emails to the show and said, uh, is it actually recorded in the shed in the backyard? Can you please answer for our listeners? Yeah, I can verify this is a shed and we are yeah. recording. Yeah, I mean, seriously, you guys, uh, how some of you in India are listening right now is a mystery to me. I'm super glad you are, but I'm literally in a backyard in a shed at 1045 at night, and uh, we're going to talk about some politics and some sports and some paranormal stuff. So uh, I'm thankful that you listen. I'm glad to have Bethany and Russell with us tonight. We're going to chop it up and talk about all of these things. Uh, But first, let's get to some comments and corrections. Keystone 65, Hanobia 44. No Bigfoot invites. Not yet, but we are still trusting and believing that it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Two beautiful cities, one in South Dakota, one in Oklahoma. Which one is going to bring us out? Which one of you is going to have the shed with Wes Anderson go live from their event? 
Keystone, Hanobia, whichever of you would like to have us, you can reach the show. You can reach us by emailing in the shed with Wes at gmail.com. In the shed with Wes at gmail.com. Now, my tools, I can't go any further in our show tonight without wishing a very happy, happy birthday to my daughter, Layla, who turns five today. Happy birthday, Layla. Uh, you are such a blessing to all who know you. Daddy loves you. And uh, she will be so proud to get a birthday shout out on this show. All right, since we just did a show a couple days ago, that's all the comments and corrections we have tonight. And uh, we don't have any listener emails to read tonight, but if you want your email read live on air on our next episode, you can reach us by emailing us at intheshedwithwest at gmail.com. Again, that's intheshedwithwest at gmail.com. No spaces, all lowercase, one word. And uh, we'll read what you have to say on air. Since we do have guests with us on In The Shed tonight, I thought before we hit the headlines, before we get to the news, I thought we'd play a little game. Y'all want to play a game? Yep. All right, Russell's in. Bethany, you in? Yep. Okay, we're going to play a game. This is a little game I came up with called Cap or Dap. Cap or Dap. So if you hear this game played anywhere else, you will you will know that it started first here on In The Shed. Cap, of course, meaning that something is untrue, that that statement is a lie, that it is something you do not agree with. And Dap, meaning something that you would agree with, uh, something that you think is noteworthy or correct. All right, first one. You may not be aware of this, but it actually is National Condiment. Condiment. I have to make sure I get my enunciation there. Very important. It's National Condiment Month. And I was surprised to find out that the best-selling condiment in the world is not ketchup. It's actually mayonnaise. It's actually mayonnaise. So, Bethany and Russell, cap or dap, mayonnaise is the best condiment available. I'm calling cap. There are plenty of haters for mayonnaise out there. While I'm not one of them, it's an okay condiment. I have to go with ketchup as the classic. It is the most versatile condiment. You can dip tater tots in it. You got your fries. Hot dogs, hamburgers, it is all good. It goes on everything. It goes on everything. Everything. But if we're talking about the new best condiments, I have to give a shout out to Chick-fil-A and say it would either be the Polynesian sauce or Chick-fil-A sauce, mm, which you Polynesian. can now buy at Walmart. Uh, I, I remember Halloween time, uh, the rapper, uh, Grammy, Grammy winning rapper, Lecrae, he put out on Twitter that uh, he was going to hand out Polynesian sauce to the kids with the best costumes when they came through. <laughs> that thought, is my kind of house. I thought that was pretty funny. All right, so Bethany says cap. She's calling cap on that one. Mayonnaise is not the best condiment. Russell, what do you have to say? I'm going to say dap. Dap? Oh. I don't, I don't think you can make a sandwich properly without mayonnaise. Mm. I mean, you can't make chicken salad without mayonnaise. Mm. There's so many things that mayonnaise goes in. Mm. So I mean, I guess purely as a condiment... Okay, it's like second tier. But versatility, you were saying ketchup's most versatile? I think it's mayonnaise. You got a little marital dispute happening about some, <laughs> about some See, condiments. You're witnessing this live. <laughs> when I hear a condiment, I think more of an accessory. Uh, mayonnaise just isn't the best accessory. I got to say, I'm going with Bethany on this one. I call cap. Uh, Russell says that mayonnaise goes on so many things. One thing it does not go on or in is my mouth. Because I find it to be disgusting. I can't. I can't look at mayonnaise. It just grosses me out. I don't know. When we're putting away groceries, I I won't put it in the fridge. My wife look at me. I'm like, you gotta put that one in the pantry yourself. I'm not touching it. Call me childish. I'm not touching it. It's the years of eating miracle. Whip. Thanks, mom. <laughs> All right. Uh, number two. It is a good idea for Vice President Harris to participate in a forum about empowering women, hosted. By Bill Clinton. Cap or dap? I'm going to come right out and say cap <laughs> just because of the host. I think I ha you had me going there. You had me going at the beginning. Right. And then you lost me at the end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm going to concur and say cap because I just don't feel like Bill Clinton and empowering women go in the same Ooh, sentence. My yes. goodness. So I'm going to say cap on that one. I think they went with Bill Clinton because uh, their first choice, Bill Cosby, was <laughs> not <laughs> Uh, I, I have to agree with you. I'm saying cap on that one. I saw this. I thought it was a, an Onion article. It's not. This is something. <laughs> this is this is really happening. Uh, I did not. You know the rest of it. Yeah, maybe I, we should not, ask Monica about this is, how Bill feels about empowering women. This, this is a family show, so I won't finish the quote. Uh, I think we're going to call cap on that one. 
Uh, number three, we're in the middle of the NCAA basketball tournament. Gonzaga, who is the number one overall seed, they're undefeated on the season. Cap or dap, Gonzaga will go undefeated and win the whole thing, becoming NCAA champions. What do you say? I say cap as much as I hate to say it. I think Coach Oates and the Crimson Tide have a good shot. Ooh. What do you say, Russell? Cap or dap? Gonzaga, you think they'll be undefeated or do you think somebody will get them? Sure, we'll say undefeated. Undefeated. I, I'm going to say Cap, look, I think Gonzaga is the best team. They're the most talented team. They have a, a terrific coach. But how hard it is to just go undefeated. I mean, we're talking about like 30 to 32 games, 35 games, undefeated in the season. Uh, and, I mean, they've made it this far. They're in the Sweet 16. They've got, uh, let's see, Sweet 16, Elite Eight, Final Four. They've got four games left. They've made it this far. Uh, I don't see it happening. I'm going to say Cap. I think somebody beats them. Uh, next one, Cap or Dap. It's Kanye's fault that he and Kim K are no longer married. Cap or dap? Might be straight caps for me. It takes two to tango, and it Ooh. takes two to build or destroy a marriage. It takes two to tango, and they just were tangoing separately. They just, they not, they not together no more. So, you know, pull one out for my homie Kanye. Uh, run again in 2024, big dog. You, you got this. What do you think, Russell? Cap or dap? Oh, I wanted to say dap. Because of his ego is is enough for two people. Does he have an ego, Kanye? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you can't but, say Kim doesn't have an ego. No, I, no, I, I thought about it, and I'm going to say Cap because I agree. It, it does take two to, to That's, make the whole marriage thing work. For the sake of your marriage, that was a good answer. I, <laughs> I heard that uh, Kanye West is going to be hosting a forum with the vice president on empowering <laughs> women. <laughs> I don't, uh, no, I'm going to say I'm going to say Cap. Also, I agree with both of you. Uh, look, here's the thing. People give Kanye a hard time because of his ego, because of his, his mental health problems and struggles that he's had. But yo, Kanye has only been married one time. This is Kim K's third marriage. And Shawty ain't stayed married for very long to any of them. Like, I, my personal opinion, this is just me. Personal opinion, just me. I think that Kanye West just didn't want to be in the spotlight. You know, Kim Kardashian, their whole family, they're the type of people, when they leave the house, they call the paparazzi and say, I heard Kim Kardashian is going to be heading down the street in five minutes because they want the paparazzi. They want the press. That's how they make their living. Kanye's tired of that. He just want to go to the ranch in Wyoming and read his Bible, hang out with his children. That's all that man want to do. So I think he just got tired of it. Uh, it does take two. I'm sure they both contributed to it. They, they grew in separate directions. But, yo. Just lay off Kanye. The man's had a rough time, all right? He's had a rough time. All right, here we go. Cap or dap, the next one. Bigfoot is real. Cap or dap? Well, I'm going to disagree with my husband here and call Cap. I'm a Bigfoot doubter. Ooh. Maybe they will find him in South Dakota. Maybe they're just trying to bring in tourists. I don't know. But I have seen nothing to believe that Bigfoot is real. The museum in Blue Ridge, Georgia did not convince me. Wait, 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 wait. Hold up. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is my sister. This is news to me. I'm sorry. Did you say the Bigfoot Museum? There is, in fact, in near the small town of Blue Ridge, Georgia, a Bigfoot Museum. That, that, you, that you have been to personally? Yes. Hold the presses. <laughs> I, t I have been to the museum on an anniversary trip, and as a favor to my husband, I did go through it with a semi-open mind. Wait, 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 wait. This gets better. On an anniversary trip... You went to a Bigfoot museum. We're one of a kind. What so else? okay. So you're saying you're saying cap, but just based on your answer, I'm gonna come out and say that Russell, are you saying dap on this one? I say dap on Bigfoot. I'm hopeful. Are you a hopeful skeptic or are you a hopeful believer? Believer. All right. I, All right. I would really I would be thrilled to find out that it was a, that Bigfoot was real. Yeah. Well, yeah. the only Bigfoot I believe in is the host of this show sitting in front oh, of me. Oh, <laughs> man. Shots fired. Shots fired in the shed. Call the popo. I ain't scared of the popo. Uh, I'm going to agree with your husband on this one, my brother-in-law. I'm going with Dap. I am a Bigfoot believer, a hopeful believer, kind of like what Russell said. I Look, we haven't seen any proof, but I want it to be real. And look. I mean, the truth is, there are animals discovered all the time, even big ones, even big ones throughout the world that we thought were extinct that aren't. Um, that we for is it possible for there to be some type of creature in North America that we haven't classified, that we don't think is it exists, or that isn't natural here, but that's here? Of course there is. Of course there is. Why not? I'm gonna say that. And 
I'm just going to throw this out there. I've been trying since this show existed to get us an invite to a Bigfoot festival. There's two that I know about. One in Keystone, South Dakota. One in Hanovia, Oklahoma. And we want to bring the show. We want to bring the shed, all 60 of our listeners. We're going we're gonna to bring the podcast to you. Whichever one of you emails me first, we're going to fly out there on our dime, okay? You put me up in a $35 motel, I'll bring the show. All I need is an extension cord. Well, I might not need it there, but a computer, a microphone, and I got that. And I'll push your Bigfoot merch. My people, Meemaw will buy a t-shirt. You know Meemaw will buy a t-shirt. All right, Bigfoot, uh, you say cap, Russell and I say dap. A couple more, a few more here. Uh, cap or dap, more than one octopus is called octopuses. Cap. Cap. <laughs> I just, I don't like that. <laughs> it's, it is not, it's not natural to say. Uh, this comes from our last episode, episode 009. Uh, I shared a story about octopuses possibly being aliens, and in this story, the whole time it said octopuses. <laughs> I read it. I'm far more comfortable with octopi, right? Octopi. I'm pretty sure it's one of those anomalies in our lovely English language where Mm. it has the same singular and plural form like deer. Mm, Deer. D-E-E-R, not D-E-A-R. Correct. Okay. So you think a plural octopus is octopus? That's that's what I think. So, all right, I got uh, full disclosure. I got a text from Meemaw today. Uh, If you listened to this show before, you know that Meemaw is an avid listener. And uh, she said that according to her Siri, so Meemaw will be working with technology, y'all. She said that octopuses <laughs> is actually correct, according to Siri, but that I guess somewhere along the way, octopi also became something that people say too, and it's kind of accepted now. And there was a third one too. What was it? Octopuses, octopi, octopossi, I think. I think octopus. I do like that yeah. one. That one's kind of fun, it's right? Like the James Bond movie. Octo- <laughs> octopus. Yeah, yeah. And to clarify for new listeners, we are talking about our own personal Meemaw, yeah. not Meemaw, lovely Governor Ivy. Yeah, she's great too. But uh, yeah, when I talk about Meemaw, I literally mean my grandmother. And she is a gem. And she's awesome. And I love her. Meemaw, shout out to you. That's why I end the show every week. Every week. Last thing I say, Meemaw, we made it. Because that's my Meemaw. That's my dog. I got her. All right, let's move on. <laughs> Last one, cap or dap. Our grandpa, your grandpa-in-law, mm-hmm. Russell, yep. our grandpa would beat Chuck Norris head-to-head in a fight to the death, cap or dap. I might have to plead the fifth here. You can't plead the fifth on <laughs> cap or dap. Who's winning? Grandpa and Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris is 81. Grandpa just turned 80. Head-to-head. Fight to the death. Who you got? Are the brass knuckles involved? No. No brass knuckles. So no weapons. We're talking fist fight. Fisticuffs. Old school. I gotta say, if the stories that Grandpa tells mm. are true, mm. I gotta say Grandpa wins it. Mm. So we got we got a dap over there from Russell. Dap. I'll, I'll give you that. If the stories Grandpa says are true and are not as exaggerated as some might speculate, <laughs> he might have a shot. We got we got a dap. That sounds like a dap from Bethany. <laughs> and I'm going to say a dap. I've already made myself clear. Look, here's the deal. Chuck Norris is 81 years old. That man can't get his roundhouse kick up. No way. He's not that flexible anymore. All those years in a bow flex ruined his joints. And my grandpa has the death grip that could bring a grown man to his knees you put my grandpa up against any 80-year-old in this planet, and he'll take him down. That's what I believe. That's my belief. I do like to go for the underdog. My firm belief. <laughs> so that was Cap or Dap, a game that we will play any time and every time that we have a guest. Like I said, I came up with it. If you hear it anywhere else, just remember that we had it first. Okay, enough of that. Let's get to the news, and let's hit the headlines. Biden takes sixth weekend away from White House in first nine weeks as president, says Breitbart. Why does American infrastructure cost more and take longer to build than it used to, asks Reason.com. From the Christian Science Monitor, Georgia elections bill raises questions of voter suppression. The real border crisis, America has tried to solve its immigration problem for decades through brute force. It doesn't work, writes The Atlantic. And finally... SCOTUS just changed the game on how crooked cops can be prosecuted, and that's from MSNBC. Our first news story in the world of politics this week, Cuomo testing story stirs controversy for CNN anchor. 
CNN should investigate anchor Chris Cuomo, and he should publicly talk about allegations that he received prioritized COVID-19 testing ordered by his brother, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, while reporting on the pandemic, said Matthew Hall, national president of the Society of Professional Journalists. What does CNN internal policy say? Hall asked. Do they have a code of ethics? Do they have something that would guide this situation and that would spell out sanctions for potential violations? CNN should do an internal probe as well and see if Chris upheld its internal policy, and if not, they should decide what to do. In addition, Hall said Cuomo should be willing to publicly discuss his conduct. To me, Chris should address this immediately on his show, Hall said. He should be upfront about it. He should probably grant interviews from outside sources from journalists outside CNN. I think that would help to answer questions about this that people are going to have. Hall is just one of several media observers calling out both CNN and Cuomo after it was alleged that he and other members of the governor's family received priority COVID-19 testing last year. The Albany Times Union reported Wednesday that Andrew Cuomo and Health Commissioner Howard Zucker instructed New York State Department of Health personnel to prioritize testing for Cuomo family members, including the CNN anchor. As a result, Chris Cuomo was tested in his Long Island home and then learned the results were positive. He announced that he had the virus to CNN viewers on March 31st of last year. CNN spokesperson Matt Dornick, after the controversy erupted, issued a statement saying that it was natural for the CNN anchor to reach out to anyone he could for help amid the early weeks of the pandemic. It is not surprising that in the earliest days of a once in a century global pandemic, when Chris was showing symptoms and was concerned about possible spread, he turned to anyone he could for advice and assistance, Dornick said in a statement given to the Washington Post. CNN declined to comment in response to the subsequent reactions. Chris Cuomo did not immediately respond to questions from The Hill about that alleged special treatment and if he discussed it with CNN management or viewers. Cuomo is off the air this week as he takes a previously scheduled vacation, according to a report by the Los Angeles Times. All right, so what do y'all think about this story? Uh, Apparently, Chris Cuomo and other members of the family were given uh, special treatment and were tested early for the coronavirus uh, since his brother... Andrew Cuomo happens to be the governor of New York. What are your thoughts? I've got to say that as more and more has come to light about the atrocities that took place in New York, it's very disheartening to hear. And it's another example of in America of what privilege can get you. And if you know the right people, you get prioritized over some people who should have been the priority, like the elderly folks in right. the nursing homes in New York. Yeah, f- for sure. That's one thing we try to highlight on this show a lot is, uh, you know, used to in America, uh, we had this idea of public servanthood, right? Like people who are elected to office are elected to serve the public. And somewhere along the way, something happened, and no longer do we have very many people who are elected to office who actually serve the public, but instead they use their power uh, and their position to enrich themselves and their family, to get special treatment. And uh, look, we're going to call that out on this show anytime we see it. I don't care if it's a Republican, a Democrat, whatever. Um, this appears to be one of those situations. I remember when uh, the younger Cuomo on his show uh, kind of said that he had the the virus and he continued to do his show live. You remember that? Like he would show him like working out at home, like doing push-ups, and then he would come on the air and talk about how he felt really bad at night, but he's okay today and all this different stuff. And uh, now looking back to see that he actually knew that he had it because his brother got him tested earlier – Um, I don't know that it's necessarily morally wrong. Like, if my brother was the governor, like, maybe I would want to know, too. Like, hey, bro, I'm feeling sick. But it's definitely not a good look. Like, it just doesn't give the good appearance. It doesn't, um, it kind of reeks of, of, uh, like you said, Bethany, of privilege. And it's not something, especially with everything else that uh, Governor Cuomo is in hot water for right now. Uh, This is just another Another example of uh, misuse of power and poor decision making. Um, what do you think, Russell? Um, yeah. Without echoing everything y'all have already said, uh, not surprising. Not you surprising. Know, at this point, sort of expected behavior. Yeah. yeah. And the, the timing of the vacation seems like it could possibly be convenient without yes. making any assumptions. Yes. Maybe it's giving CNN kind of time Yo, to, I didn't even think about that, right? to clear <laughs> up this mess because there's a lot of speculation that Chris Cuomo might be um, new to the political scene as his brother has taken quite the tumble from New York's most eligible bachelor to 
probably the person on the hot seat the most in the state. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Previously, they made sure to say previously scheduled, which probably means that it was not previously <laughs> scheduled. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the weirdest things for me this whole last year, it's been a crazy year, crazy year, but one of the weirdest things that just never sat right with me, do you realize that Governor Cuomo won an Emmy for his press conferences that he was holding every day about the coronavirus? Is that weird? Like, look, I know this is important public information, and like, I, I watched some of his press conferences when this first when this first started happening because I wanted to know what was going on, and some of the other ones weren't very helpful. So I watched his, and like, I appreciated the information. But for someone to get an Emmy for for public service announcement announcements about a pandemic just seems kind of odd. And then you have all these celebrities who are like getting their vaccines on television and like it it's just a it's a weird time, man. Twenty twenty one. What a weird time to be alive. <laughs> so the Cuomos, uh yeah, they're in some hot water right now and uh it's gonna be interesting to see what happens with them, but I don't think there's very many awards in Governor Cuomo's future. Uh so that's all for that one. Let's move to our next news story. Our next story in the world of politics. Tim Allen recalls serving time in prison on cocaine charges in his early twenties. Whoa! Yeah, right. <laughs> who who knew? Did you have you ever heard this? Did you know no. this? No, no. Oh, I, I have to say, when I hear Tim Allen, I think of the Santa Claus. Yeah, no, the Santa Claus and Buzz Lightyear was. This is a quote from his article. All effed up. We about to learn together. Wow. <laughs> let let me learn you. Let me learn you some knowledge real quick on Tim Allen. This is what it says. Tim Allen opens up about serving time in prison and what he learned. Long before Home Improvement, Buzz Lightyear, and Last Man Standing, Allen was a lost 20-something F-up who served time in federal prison on cocaine charges. Cocaine charges. That, that nose candy. That, the white powder. Cocaine charges. Tim a- the Santa Claus. The San- that kind of makes the snow. Santa Claus snow. Okay. All right. He talks about that experience as well as his politics as a Hollywood conservative on WTF with Mark Marin podcast. I was an F up, Alan, 67, admitted of his life before prison. His father was killed in a horrific car crash caused by a drunk driver when he was 11. That will do it. That will make you become an F up. But he had already started drinking a year before that. I take back, I retract my last statement. He was already drinking at At 10. 10. At 10. Inspired by movie cowboys throwing back shots of whiskey. After my old man died, I really just played games with people and told adults what they wanted to hear and then stole their booze, he said. (laughs) Really, I was Eddie Haskell from Leave it to Beaver. Yes, Miss Cleaver. No, Miss Cleaver. I knew exactly what adults wanted. Make your bed, be polite, use a napkin, and then I'd go steal everything in the house. In 1978, he was arrested at the Kalamazoo Battle Creek International Airport in Michigan with over a pound of cocaine in his luggage. That's a lot of cocaine, I I think. He pled guilty to drug trafficking charges, thinking the sentence wouldn't be too harsh, then was sent to federal prison aged 23 for two years and four months. We were a bunch of college kids, a bunch of kids who overdid it, and then two of us took the punishment for about 20 guys. He said, I was very contrite, after the arrest because the way he was living was a terribly stressful experience. In the eight months he waited before sentencing, the aspiring stand-up started to look at his life and for the first time make goals for when he came out. I didn't think that they would do that, he said of the multi-year prison term, and neither did my attorney, and then they came hard on me. However, he did have an inkling right before. I knew bad things were going to happen, but I wanted to be able to come out of prison with something. He served time in three different federal prisons. I just shut up and did what I was told, he said. It was the first time ever that I did what I was told and that I played the game. I learned literally how to live day by day, and I learned how to shut up. You definitely want to learn how to shut up in prison. He said he quickly fell into the rhythm of prison life. I don't say this lightly, and anybody who has been incarcerated knows it's surprising what the human being will get used to, he said. Eventually, after eight months, I got used to it. There were okay times. Saturday, we got better food. Eventually, I went from a holding cell arrangement to my own cell. He recalled calling home on Thanksgiving to his mother right after he got his own cell, describing it as embarrassingly funny to me. He said his call was interrupted, was interrupting dinner, and he filled her in on how proud he was that he got his own cell. And he, he's just really proud of it. Uh, she goes, that's good. Steve graduated from Purdue. Jeff's on his way to Michigan State. 
and one of my oldest sons got his own prison cell. Alan is nearly 23 years sober. Good job, Mr. Tim. He recalled having that first drink at 10 after every cowboy movie I saw as a kid showed men riding horses, tying them up, having a shot of whiskey, and then riding off. He thought, that stuff's got to be pretty refreshing. So I went down to a friend's house, and I poured Jim Beam into a jigger. Not a shot glass. It was two and a half shots, actually, and I downed it, just like what was on TV. It was like I drank a bottle of gasoline. Any normal person would have said, that's it. That's a no from me. However, I said, well, maybe I need more water, and I got used to it. He continued, alcohol for me, I'm going on 23 years sober and clean of everything. Alcohol never affected me like the other guys. I could drink copious amounts even as a young kid. After telling a story about having an alcohol blackout during his college years, during which he was drunk and drove his friends in his car, he said, I look back on those things, this is sober guy stuff. I had so much shame at the things that I did, especially driving people around. Coming from a dad that was killed that way, it's difficult for me to get past it now. Of his two decades plus of sobriety, he said, grateful is the word. I love my life. I'm not any more mentally stable. I have the same issues I've always had, but now I don't hide from them. Allen, a rare Hollywood conservative who attended Trump's 2016 inauguration, talked a little politics as well. I just don't like... Once I started making money, I had this silent partner that took almost half of my money and never gave me anything for it. Taxes, he said. I've never liked taxes. Whoever takes the taxes and never tells me what they did with it, I'm a fiscal conservative person with money. That's it. I had this silent partner, he said, referring to the government. Never liked taxes. Never liked what they do with taxes and all the BS from both sides. It's not their money. He said he's never gotten into trouble professionally for being candid about his political beliefs because I literally don't preach anything. What I've done is just not joined into, as I call it, the we culture. I'm not telling anybody else how to live. I don't like that. We should do this. We should do that. Speaking about Trump without saying his name, he continued, Once I realized that the last president made people mad, I just kind of liked it. Alan laughed. So it was fun to just not say anything. I didn't join in on the lynching crowd. Alan went on to say that he knows the Clintons and Bill has been genuinely a nice guy to me. Uh, following up on that uh, women's empowerment thing. He said that he would send along his movies when he was in the White House, something he also did for George W. Bush and Barack Obama as well. I just didn't think that Hillary should have been president, he said. In the end, you go the other direction. There's nothing personal about it. If you don't like it, then wait till the next election and vote for who you do like. All right, so Tim Allen, the Santa Claus, Tim Allen, Buzz Lightyear, did some hard time for drug trafficking. Apparently has turned his life around, 23 years sober, and uh, was back in the news recently because he was a Trump supporter. It was like the number three thing trending on Twitter. Uh, cancel Buzz Lightyear. I, I, <laughs> I, got a, I got a kick out of it. Look, I say on the show all the time uh, that we need both the left wing and the right wing for this bird to fly. Like We need both sides. Just because you disagree with somebody politically doesn't mean that uh, they're a bad person or that they're your enemy. We're all Americans. I'm often too conservative for my liberal friends, too liberal for my conservative friends. Uh, but yo, he's Buzz Lightyear. You can't replace him. That voice is Buzz Lightyear. And uh, I didn't know about this. Did you guys know about this? I do not know about this, but I can't say that I'm surprised with the rise of this cancel culture movement, and I'm not a fan of it on either side. This is a free country. Whichever way you believe in, you should be able to express that, and it should not affect someone's job. Right. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think what he says is pretty sensical, sensical, sensible there, right? Like he says, uh, you know, you vote for who you like, and if it doesn't work out, you just wait four years, and you vote for the person you do like. And uh, we need some of that. We need a little bit of uh, a little bit of chill. Everybody just tamp it down a little bit. We yeah. don't need all the extremes. We don't need all the hatred. Like, we in this together. And maybe if we did a better job of supporting whoever was in office, whether we agreed with them or not, our country would be better. Mm. Preach, preach, preach. Here we go. Preach. Yeah. I agree. Our last story this week in the world of politics, Fox News reporter confronts Saki after Biden doesn't take question and press her. Fox News reporter Peter Ducey confronted White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki on Friday after the network did not get to ask a question of President Biden at his first press conference. At Friday's press briefing, Ducey noted that Biden had a list of journalists to call on and that Fox News was the only member of the five-network press pool to not get to ask a question of the president. 
I'm curious if that is the official administration policy, Ducey said. We're here having a conversation, aren't we? Saki responded. And do I take questions from you every time I come to the briefing room? Has the president taken questions from you since he came into office? Yes or no? Ducey said that Biden sometimes responds to his shouted questions at White House events, but that when Biden has a list in front of him, he never calls on Fox News, dating back to his campaign. I'm just curious with this list that he has given, Ducey said. The only member of the Five Network pool never on it dating back to when he resumed in-person events in Wilmington during his campaign is Fox News. Saki noted that she takes questions from Ducey every day in the briefing room and that she regularly appears on Fox News Sunday. I'd say that I'm always happy to have this conversation with you even about the awesome socks that you're wearing today and have a conversation with you even when we disagree, she said. The president has taken your questions and I'm looking forward to doing Fox News Sunday this week for the third time in the last few months. Biden took questions from reporters at 10 different outlets on Thursday during his first press conference as president, but notably steered clear of right-leaning Fox News. Ducey has emerged as a regular sparring partner for Saki at the daily briefings, challenging the White House with pointed questions about immigration and other hot topics of the day. The Fox News reporter is also known to try to get Biden to answer impromptu questions at scripted events and to ask questions that other outlets have avoided on topics such as the president's son, Hunter Biden. Yeah, so I don't know if you, you guys saw this. Uh, Biden had his, President Biden had his first um, news conference, and uh, it appeared, uh, he, which he, he actually did a pretty good job, like honestly, like he answered the questions, he, he seemed knowledgeable about the topics, like he did a good job. Um, he held it together for the most part. Um, he's been upfront about his, his stutter that he's had since a child. That was present, but that's not a big deal. Um, but he also appeared to be looking at note cards. And so a lot of people have kind of made a big deal about the fact that he would look down at a note card and then call on a news organization and then look down at a note card and give an answer. And so a lot of people had some questions about how scripted this event was uh, and that if he had already predetermined who he was going to call on, if his people had screened questions. And uh, this guy is bringing up the point that he doesn't tend to call on Fox News uh, whenever he does have an event where he's answering questions from the press. Um, I don't know. I, I can't blame him, honestly. Uh, Fox News has been pretty rough on Joe Biden dating back to the campaign. Uh, they have led and been out front with not just saying that maybe he's lost a, se a step since he was vice president, but they've gone as far on some of those shows to say that the man's suffering from dementia and that he's not going to be in charge when he's in the White House. And that's got to be rough, like to see that said about you on TV, on national TV. So on the one hand, I don't blame him for calling, not calling on Fox News. Uh, but at the same time, I think that whoever is president should be able to answer questions from all sides, from every angle. Uh, it's the journalist's job to be the watchdog of government, right? And so he should be able to call on left-leaning news sources, right-leaning news sources, those in the middle, and uh, answer whatever questions. That's, that's what I think. That's what I see in this story. Uh, what do you guys think about it? I feel like a lot of Americans are confused. The Biden administration seems to have a different approach and protocols for speaking to the media that is different than previous presidents, namely President Donald Trump. True. And I think that by him not answering questions by everyone, it only further fuels the fire for those who claim that President Biden is not mentally there and relies on other people to give him information and is essentially a puppet. While that is not something that I know to be true, I think that by him not answering the questions directed by Fox, it adds fuel to the fire. I have noticed him stumble. He could be nervous in front of people. It's no surprise to anyone that he's older. I don't know, but I think that if they want to quiet some of that, he's going to have to be able to take questions from everyone in real time. For sure, yeah. I mean, I said on the last episode of the show that uh, if, if, you're being, if you're being honest, like if you're being objective, uh, the man has obviously lost a step since he was vice president. Like you can watch him talk when he was vice president and watch him talk now. It's not the same. Uh, but, but the man is the oldest president that we've ever had, all right? It's not like, uh, I mean, you, you talk to your grandparents. Sometimes they, they forget what day it is, or they say the wrong thing. Is it a little bit alarming that that's the president of the United States? Sometimes. Uh, but I, I don't think that it's in bounds to just say, 
as a as a fact that the man has dementia and that he's off his rocker. I think that's too far. I also think it's too far to pretend that he's just this uh, young, virile, strapping man with no flaws. Like that's kind of crazy too. Like let's let's play this thing straight. You know, he's not where he used to be. Um, does that mean that he can't do the job? No, not necessarily. We all lose a step when we get older. Uh, but yeah, I agree. I think that he should uh, he should answer questions from everybody. That's the easiest way to prove that, that you're up to the job, right? Just to kind of say uh, what questions do you have and to answer them. Uh, what do you think, Russell? What do you see in this story? Yeah, I mean, I think we can all agree uh, being the president of the best country in the world is... Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> no offense to our overseas listeners. Yo, India, India, don't listen to that man. Don't. That's my brother-in-law. I love him, but I got you, India. I uh, love you, India. We might be a little biased. My boy, Ramesh, I love you. I love you. <laughs> shout Look, out. Listen, personal shout out, Ramesh. You listen to the show. He's emailed twice. The only person to email twice. Not even Mima has done that. She sent one email. I couldn't read it. I, I think she sent half a sentence. Love you, Mima, but you did. Uh, yo, he says the U.S. is the best country, but Ramesh, I'm not worried about the U.S., homie. I want to be on a billboard in India. Put me on a billboard. Corporations in India, we are growing. 13.8% of our listening audience comes from your wonderful nation, and uh, I don't want to be famous in America. I want to be known in India. It's more people. It's more people. They make beautiful music, and uh, yeah, so... You say, you say that. I, I say that, that, the that, that is just my opinion. It's your opinion. That's his opinion. I'm going with India. And if you keep up on popular meme culture, you know that Joe Biden has missed a few steps, both physically and oh. <laughs> Low blow. <laughs> Low blow. Grandpa Sorry, Joe. Mr. President, hey, she not she not getting her stimmy. No stimmy coming. No it stimmy is coming. still pending. Uh, yeah, they, they're yo, gonna, they're gonna cancel the man did fall on the steps, though. <laughs> I felt bad. Yeah, it was rough. I mean, in front of the whole world, and to fall is not a big deal. Everybody trips going up steps in their life. But the second fall, yeah. and then the third. I have to say, I saw the video of him falling with "Give me three steps" in the oh, background. Oh no! One of, one of my other brother-in-law sent me a text today, and it was a meme of Steph Curry crossing over, doing a crossover <laughs> dribble, and, and Joe Biden biting the dust. And, uh, uh, that's so good. You know, but you know what? He picked himself up, and we got to the top of the stairs. He turned and saluted our military. So uh, he did. He made you know, it. God bless America, and also India. That's all for the world of politics. We're going to move on to the world of sports now, and we're going to talk about the NCAA basketball tournament. As you know, we're down to the Sweet 16, 16 teams, eight matchups left before we find out who will be this year's national champion. Um, We're not talking about any other sports tonight. We're not talking about the NBA, no NFL. We never talk about baseball because uh, three to one is just not fun. It's just not fun. Soccer, you can kick rocks. Uh, uh, but we're going to pick the games. NCAA tournament, we're going to go through the matchups left. And uh, each of us will give our pick who we think is going to win the game. Um, as you know, if you have listened to In the Shed with Wes Anderson at the beginning of the basketball season, the very first podcast we ever did, I gave you three teams to watch this season. The Florida State Seminoles, the Houston Cougars, and the Alabama Crimson Tide. All three teams that I gave you are in the Sweet 16. That's a pretty good record. I'm just saying, we don't always get it right, but we come close. And legal we disclaimer for listeners, I have not been keeping up with the NCAA tournament this year as my personal team that I follow has opted out of the tournament. Yeah, so I, these options that I'm giving are pure guesses. That's all it ever is for anybody. Pure yeah. guesses. Pure and guesses. I, uh, I actually don't follow sports at all. <laughs> so this this is also just That's guesses. a dab. That's a dab. That's, That's not a cap. <laughs> That's a dab. Yeah. Russell, Russell is to sports as uh, President Biden is to stairs. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> but you yeah. know, we're the example of a contemporary marriage where the wife yeah. is the sports fan. Yeah. 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 And and I, I'll say, too, uh, you know, I've, I've told you before, we follow Auburn. We follow Kentucky in our family. Those are our teams. They didn't make the tournament, but, you know, I love basketball, so we're going to roll with it. We got the West Bracket, uh, the very the number one overall seed, Gonzaga Bulldogs, who are undefeated on the season. They're playing the five seed, the Creighton Blue Jays. Uh, Bethany Russell, who do you think will win that game, Gonzaga or Creighton? I said earlier that Gonzaga's going to take it all the way, so I guess I have to say that they're going to win it. True, true. 
I'm going to have to go with the underdog. I'm picking Creighton. Creighton. Crazier okay. things have happened. Okay. I'll say, if Gonzaga loses, I'm not saying they're going to lose this game, uh, but if they lose, it very well could be this one. Creighton, uh, another small school just like Gonzaga, not from a Power 5 conference, but they can shoot the ball. They've got a lot of depth, a lot of scores, a lot of athletes. I'm going to take Gonzaga in this one, but it's going to be a lot closer than people think. Creighton can score with Gonzaga. I don't think that they have enough defense to win this game. I'm going to go with Gonzaga. So that puts me and Russell with Gonzaga and Bethany with Creighton. The other game, the other matchup from the West bracket, 6 seed USC Trojans, 7 seed the Oregon Ducks. Who you got in that one, Bethany? I just can't go for USC, so I'm just going to pick the Ducks. Are you a USC hater? I'm not a USC hater, but I do associate USC with a very notorious American figure. Mm. Mm. Let me take a stab at who that might be. <laughs> He's also named after a breakfast drink, if that clears it up. I'm just going to say this in defense of O.J. Simpson. He's a fun follow on Twitter. <laughs> the man the man is a fun follow. Look, he... That's bold. He, he, he very probably, very probably, possibly, might be a murderer. But he's a lot of fun on Twitter. Because on Twitter, the man, the man posts. He's very undeterred by comments in his section in his comment section. But he posts videos on Twitter and every time. He's like, "Hello, Twitter world. It's O.J. Simpson, and I just want to talk to you about the football game this weekend." And the only comments that people put in there are like uh, knife emojis and like "You suck," and <laughs> <laughs> like. But he just come back. He come back strong the very next day. Hello, Twitter world. It's OJ. Sim- like to have someone accused of the things that he was accused of, be just like on social media, just talking to you about what's happening in the world. It's just a crazy thing, and it's it's a fun Twitter follow. So, in defense of, in def- in defense of OJ Simpson, Mm-mm. that's all I got. Uh, Russell, USC or Oregon? Who are you taking? See what are, I'll do mascot votes. Okay. So we got Trojans and Ducks. Trojans and Ducks. Uh, I'll go with Ducks. Ducks. I think I like that mascot better. You like the duck. And uh, I'm actually going to go with Oregon too. USC's having a great season. They're doing way better than projected. These two teams have played already this year a couple times. They're from the same conference. Uh, but Oregon is a little bit more disciplined. Um, they have more scoring potential. USC's got a couple of talented uh, freshmen that they're going to be NBA players. But I'm going to go with Oregon in this game. In the East bracket, you have the one seed Michigan Wolverines against the four seed Florida State Seminoles. Bethany, who you got? Sorry, me, Mom. Going with Michigan. Oh, that's going to break her heart. Y'all, I told y'all last time, me, Ma is an Ohio State Buckeye fan. Uh, She's not fond of the Michigan Wolverines. But you're going to take Michigan. Why do you pick Michigan, Bethany? Well, I have flipped through a few times and seen some games played by Michigan, and none of them were very close, so I'm just going to go with them. That's true. A lot of blowouts from Michigan. Uh, Russell, what about you? Michigan Wolverines or Florida State Seminoles? Are you sticking with your mascot decider? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, Wolverines, definitely on this one uh, because of the movie Red Dawn. When they yell out, Wolverines! Good movie. Good reference. Good reference. Yeah, you're welcome. And look, I'll say too, the original is terrific. The remake is not half bad. I've not seen the remake. Have you not seen the the updated version? Nope. Uh, so in the, up, the spoiler alert, uh, my my shedders, my tools. Uh, yeah, shedders was the backup. Shedders. That one didn't win. We picked tools, <laughs> but since it's in a shed, my my fans are the listeners are. I don't know if they're they're fans, but they listen, so I call them tools. Uh, yeah, spoiler alert on the remake of Red Dawn. The enemy was supposed to be the Chinese. Okay. But when the movie was going to come out, China was like, uh, no. And we were like, all right, we'll change yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> because <laughs> Hollywood gets a lot of investment, a lot of bank, a lot of capital from China. Yeah. And so they that's a whole other issue. We'll talk about that one day. But okay, so you're going to go with the Wolverines. I said Wolverines. Bethany goes with the Wolverines. I'm going to go with Michigan also. I have Michigan as one of my final four teams. Um, Look, I think this one has a chance to be an upset. Florida State plays great defense. Their coach, Leonard Hamilton, is one of the most underrated coaches in all of college basketball. He keeps uh, building that program year after year. Florida State, which used to be a football school only, they now play good basketball. Uh, I think there's a a decent chance that Florida State pulls it off. 
But Michigan, Michigan just has a lot of scoring punch. They have a lot of talent. I'm going to go with the Wolverines in a close one. We all agree there. The other game in the East, 11 seed UCLA Bruins and 2 seed Alabama Crimson Tide. Bethany, what are your thoughts? While you will never hear me utter those two words, I have to go with the Crimson Tide here. They're playing really well. They're hot. Apparently, they've got a good coach, though I can't say I heard about him until this year, and everybody's on the oat train. Nate Oates. So, I'm going to go with Alabama. Nate Oates. <laughs> In Alabama, we love Nate Oates, Nick Saban, and James Spann. Oats. Russell, who you got, Alabama or UCLA? I know the mascot for Alabama. What's the other one? UCLA is uh, the Bruins, which I believe is some type of bear. I think it's a bear. Okay. And I, they are one of the most storied college basketball programs they are. of all time. They are. It's true. Okay. I mean, I like bears more than elephants. So. Bears beat Battlestar, Battlestar Galactica? <laughs> We just got a Dwight Schrute reference in, <laughs> picking our basketball game. All right, so Bethany says Alabama. Russell's going UCLA the other way. Uh, I'm going to have to agree. I'm an Auburn fan, but I've told you all year long, Alabama has a squad this year. I'm going Alabama in this game. I think they at least make the next round, and then they'll have a tough game against either Michigan or Florida State. Uh, they just have too much talent. I think they're going to outpace UCLA. They're going to win that game um, again. That was one of the teams that we told you to look out for the beginning of the year, and here they are in the Sweet 16. So in the South, we have one seed, uh, Baylor. We got another Bears. You got the number one seed, Baylor Bears, and the five seed, uh, the Villanova Wildcats. Bethany, who do you think will win that matchup? I'm going to have to say Baylor. I've watched Baylor play against my very own team. They're a very good team, yep. very deep team. Yep. And I am I say I have to go with them. Shout out to Chip and Joanna. I'm pulling for your team. <laughs> Shout out to Chip and Joanna Games. <laughs> uh, go ahead and get that live stream. They got that new uh, channel. What is it? Is it Magnolia? Got to be. Magnolia something. It is, and I'm still waiting on my fixer-upper. If you're mm. listening, Chip and Joanna, come to Alabama. Uh, Chip and Joanna are definitely listening, because why would they not be listening why, to In the Shed not? with Wes Anderson? Everybody, that Ramesh is listening. My boy Ramesh, second shout-out in the in the episode. Wow. Yeah, big time. Big time, Ramesh. And uh, also, Meemaw. What's up, Meemaw? All right, so Bethany, you're taking the Baylor Bears over the Villanova Wildcats. Russell, how does the mascot breakdown happen in this one? Uh, Bears versus Wildcats. That's a good fight, but I think Bear Bear comes out on top there. Strong paw. Mm-hmm. Strong paw. Uh, I think Baylor wins this one too. This is another one that I will say could be an upset. Villanova, a very good program. Head coach Jay Wright has it rocking and rolling there. Uh, th- they've got things blowing and going over there at Villanova. Uh, but Baylor plays good defense. They've got the best backcourt in college basketball. They actually have their starting shooting guard, uh, or point guard, is a transfer from Auburn. Auburn, um, Mitchell, what's his last name? I don't remember his first name. Davion Mitchell, something like that. But anyway, I think they win this game. So uh, all of us agree on that one, Baylor. And the other game in the south bracket, the three-seed Arkansas Razorbacks and the Cinderella of the tournament so far, the 15-seed Oral Roberts. Yes, Oral Roberts. Bethany, who do you think okay, wins there? Okay, we're saying oral as in a reference to your one's mouth. O R A L. Oral. Okay. It's it's a name. It was a guy. It's a okay. small Christian okay. school in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's named after its founder, Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts. I'm going to have to say that their happy ending is going to come to an end and the Arkansas <laughs> Razorbacks oh. who I had no idea that was, even that was any accidental. type of good. Was that an accidental joke that you made there? Oral Roberts happy ending? <laughs> this, <No>. this <laughs> is Not intentional. This not, is a family show. Not intentional. This is a family what show. What I meant is their time being at the top, I believe, is going to be short-lived. And although I think the Razorbacks are one of the most idiotic mascots in yeah. college sports, yeah. I'm going to say they're going to pull this one out. Yeah, if you've ever been to a game where Arkansas plays... It's horribly annoying. They do this this <laughs> chant. I'm not kidding. They do this. All of them together in unison. It's very cult-like where they, they raise their hands and they go, they, they call it calling the hogs. I'm not making this up. They go, woo, and they do it again. Woo, and they do it a third time. Woo, and they go, pig. 
Suey! And it's like creepy. It's, I mean, really, it really is. I I've have to say, the only two good things to come out of Arkansas are Gus Malzon and Kai Omega. So I apologize to my sisters. Gus Malzon saying and that Kai they Omega. Are what about an Walmart? Idiotic mascot. What about Walmart? They came from. Did Arkansas. Walmart come from Arkansas? There? Bentonville, Arkansas, yeah. Okay, well, real, Walmart real is both good Look, and bad. I like you, Walmart. I mean, you know, I don't like to go in there because I get frustrated and I have to pray to the Lord a lot. But also, I get t shirts for $3 and they comfy as heck. So, so Walmart is cool too. Uh, so Bethany says Arkansas or Roberts is the team that ruined the season for multiple teams already. They're 15 seed, but they've gotten this far. Um, Russell, what do you think? Uh, the Arkansas Razorbacks or or the Oral Roberts? I don't know what their mascot is. Yeah, I just looked it up. They're the Golden Eagles. Oh, well, that's cool. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, I think I, I kind of like the Razorback. Mascot. Ooh, marital dispute here. I, I kind of dig okay. that. I don't like the chant. Yeah, the chant's but... creepy, for real. It's cre- <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's but creepy. But I, I kind of do like the way the mascot looks, so yeah. yeah, we'll go that way. Okay, so we got two for Arkansas. Just looks like a tasty meal to me. Mm, bacon. Um, look, I picked Arkansas as one of my final four teams. They should win this game, but there's something special about Oral Roberts this year. They're... <laughs> My brother-in-law is laughing at that. Uh, about the basketball team from that school in Tulsa. There's something special about their squad. Uh, they've won two games in, in awesome electric fashion. They have two guys on the team that put up 55 points combined in both of the first two games in the tournament. They have two guys that can score against any team in the country. So Arkansas should win this game. I did pick Arkansas to be a Final Four team. But, hey. I'm taking Oral Roberts. I'm going with the 15 seed over the three. Give me the school from Tulsa. That's who I got. Moving on to the last bracket, our last two games, the Midwest bracket, you have the eight seed Loyola Chicago, which I don't know what they're called either. Maybe the Huskies? Loyola Chicago. Something with a dog. I don't remember. The eight seed Loyola Chicago versus the 12 seed, Oregon State. And I know that they are the Beavers. I know that for sure. Bethany, who are you taking, Loyola, Chicago, or Oregon State? I'm going to say there's only room for one Oregon team advancing here, so I'm going to go with Loyola, who I have not heard of until I yeah. saw the headlines, but I'm going to pick them. Yeah, yeah, they actually made a Final Four, uh, what, like two seasons ago, two or three seasons ago. Um, but they're a smaller school from, from Chicago, and, uh, yeah, they're, they're playing really well. Um, Russell, did you find their mascot? Yep. What are they? It's like a wolf-looking okay. mascot. Okay. So you're going to go with uh, Loyola Chicago and their dog-wolf-type mascot that we can't find yet, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, email the show, in the show with Wes at gmail.com. Let us know the mascot. Uh, or the Oregon State Beavers. I'm going with Beavers. Because it's fun. Yeah, it is fun. It's fun, right? I mean, just to think like beavers versus dog or wolf. Yeah. And the beaver comes out on top. I mean, that's... I mean, just to think about the fact that at one point in time, they were choosing a name, like a mascot for their team, and they were like, hmm, going to go with the beaver. Like, yep. <laughs> I don't think I would have picked that in a million years. Like, nope. you know... So I would... my, my little league team, you know, we were the Anacondas <laughs> yeah. one year. And that's just not... That's not a great Little League team name, <laughs> but it was the most fun I had the playing Thorsby, Little League. The Thorsby Anacondas, The Thorsby right? Anacondas. Man. Shout out to uh, to Frank Davis. Frank, uh, what's up? Rest in peace. What? Sorry. <laughs> this just took a somber note. For real? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Rest yeah, in peace. Yeah, he was a great guy. Well. Sorry to bring that down. Pouring out from my homie Frank Davis. Yep. A great Little League coach. Great guy. Anacondas. The best year always we had. Always took him for ice cream, win or lose. That's Man, true. He that's always said, real. if we win this game, we'll go get ice cream. That's real. And then that's we real. lost, and he said, well, let's go get some ice cream. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> hey, Frank Davis, we need more of you in this world, my dog. And uh, you're up there with the Lord getting ice cream right now. I see you. All right. Uh, I'm going to go with Loyola Chicago in this matchup. Oregon State is a 12 seed, uh, but they shoot the ball better than any other team in the country. Or, or at least anybody left in the tournament. They're number two on the season in three-point shooting percentage. But Loyola Chicago, they play great team basketball. They move the ball. They cut. They play great defense. They're coached exceptionally well. And they're they're a really fun team to watch. They actually, uh, they're, they're a Catholic school, I believe. They have a nun that is like the team chaplain and a super fan. Um, Sister, 
Sister Jean. Sister Jean. Sister Jean. She's 103 years old, and she's at the games, and she's watching intently and rooting for her team. It's awesome. So, for if no other reason than Sister Jean, I will root for Loyola Chicago. Yeah, I actually, I'm going to change mine because I think Sister Jean is a better mascot. All right, last game that we're going to pick, 11 seed Syracuse, and their mascot is the orange. They're the Syracuse orange. Like the color of the fruit. I don't know. Just orange. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know what. Just the orange. Just okay. orange. So Syracuse or the two seed, the Houston Cougars. Bethany, what do you think? I guess I'll go with the cats. You gotta go with the cats. What do you think, Russell? I kind of like the ambiguous orange. You would. <laughs> you you would. <laughs> I don't just, know if it's, it's a just... color or a fruit, but either way, it's a terrible mascot. It is awful, and it's, that's the one I picked. It's the most inferior color, unless it is paired with an AU and a navy blue. Oh, yeah, I like that. Uh, it's the only one I can think of in college sports that is like worse, in my opinion, like automatically, is Stanford, because Stanford is the cardinal. Not like just the Cardinals, like the bird. <laughs> they're the Cardinal. Stanford, they're the Cardinal, and then they have a tree Cardinal. at their yeah. games. It's, I don't, it's a tree. It's I, a tree. I also have to throw out the flying terrapin. So I'm going to agree. I'm going to go with Houston. They're one of my final four picks. They've got two players. Uh, they got banged up a little bit in the last round. If they're healthy, Houston wins. If not, Syracuse may pull the upset. Uh, but I'm going to go with Houston there, too. Uh, that's it. Those are our picks. Um, go ahead and... Uh, Bet your life savings on the information that we've given you, especially Russell that uses yeah. mascot determination. I mean, that's that's valid. It's just as valid as anything else, I think, it, you could throw at me. It really is. It really <laughs> is. Uh, so anyway, that's who we have going into uh, the Sweet 16. The games start tomorrow. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's been a great tournament so far. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, we'll, we'll fill you in next week on how correct we were, uh, if we were correct at all. That's all for sports. Now we're going to move on to the world of the paranormal. Our first story, a grandmother calls paranormal experts after spotting demon standing over granddaughter's bed. Do you believe in demons? One woman got the fright of her life after seeing a strange figure standing over her granddaughter's bed, and she called on paranormal experts to help her find out exactly what it was. Tori McKenzie from Las Vegas explains that after her two-year-old granddaughter, Amber, had begun talking to an unseen entity in the middle of the night, she decided to install a motion-activated camera at her son Ryan's house to try to make sense of who the toddler was speaking to. Uh, side note, always a bad idea. Yeah, never always. never install cameras if no. you suspect any sort of supernatural Especially motion-sensing in your toddler's room. You're asking for it. Yeah, once you see asking it, I mean, you can't unsee this stuff. No, terrifying. A few days later, Tori admits that she checked the footage and was horrified to see an unknown figure standing close to her young granddaughter and seven-month-old grandson, Michael. It was so shocking when I saw it, I had to do a double-take, Tori says. The first thing I saw was horns on its head. Yo. So immediately you think that it's the devil or a demon. When we caught videos of the orbs, we thought it was a family member looking after the kids, but that picture... I have no idea. It's terrifying. She adds that she called on her children to help her make sense of the figure. I showed the kids, and my 13-year-old son was scared by it. I ran over to the house and showed my eldest son. We were just in shock, and he couldn't explain it either, she goes on. Everybody was asleep, so it couldn't have been my son or his partner. We, We have still shots of him in there, and it looks nothing like that. I know that it's something supernatural. Freaked out, Tori says that the family has decided to move the children to a different room for the time being. Because demons can't go to a different room. Everybody knows. I mean, it makes as much Everybody sense as some that. of these COVID protocols. Everybody knows demons are stuck to one room, so that's going to solve I mean, if you salt the doorway, I mean, <laughs> yeah. he's stuck in there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, but, uh, so she decided to move the children to a different room for the time being. Ryan moved the kids out of their room and into his room. Nothing bad has happened to them yet, but it's the fact that it could, a worried Tori explains. Tori adds that it doesn't seem like the child is terrified of the figure. That might be the scariest part of the whole story. It had horns. She thinks it's a demon, but the toddler is not terrified at all. The two-year-old isn't scared of the figure and thinks it's her friend, but one night she told it to go away, she says. 
In a bid to put the scenario to rest, Tori shared the image on a Facebook group asking paranormal experts to help. She says that when she tried to get rid of the demon by burning oils, I've never heard of that one, but okay, Cabinets and curtains opened and closed, and music began to play by yeah. itself. You're just making him mad. Creepy. Don't, don't do that. Ryan has let me try and figure it out where to go with this, so I thought I should post it on Facebook to try and get some help, she says in a Facebook group. For the most part, everybody's been supportive, suggesting what to do and who to speak to. I just want to get rid of whatever it is. She says for the most part, people have been supportive. Some yeah. people are not supportive of getting rid of the demon. Oh, you know there's some people on there have been like, like, yeah, like, I summoned him. Like, I'm going to summon some more if you don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder if the Facebook supporters were the ones who encouraged her to show the photographs to her young Ooh, children. Yeah. Because yeah. as someone yeah. who works with children, I find that very disturbing. It's disturbing. Have y'all seen the picture? No. Let me see. You I think, yeah, up? I think I just found it. Okay. I mean, it's... Holy it's Moses. Weird. Yo. That is legitimately creepy. It's weird. That's scary. Yeah, look this up online. Uh, find this story. Take a look at this picture. Email the show in the shed with Wes at gmail.com. Let me know what you think. I think it's terrifying. I mean, I'd also would need a picture of I don't of know the person to see like a kind of reference. Right. But also possibly like motion camera, uh motion blur. Could be of somebody checking on the kid. Could be. I <laughs> I don't see horns. No. Yeah, I I, that's a bit of a stretch. I don't see horns. What I see appears to be longer hair, like a woman. But if I saw that, though, like full disclosure, if I saw that on my son's uh, camera in his room, it would it would creep me out, though. Like, for oh, yeah, real. I mean, I have a, I have I don't a know that I don't know I would burn oils in response. Maybe say a prayer to the Lord, but not burn oils. But call that's just me. All right? I'm a priest. I just call myself. Like, hey, <laughs> hey, self, come in here and take out this demon. Kapow! We'll get it in the name of Jesus. All right. So that's that story. That's pretty creepy. That's a weird one. Uh, our second story in the world of the paranormal, we'll talk a little bit of aliens. U- upcoming UFO report will be difficult to explain, former national intelligence official says. A former top national intelligence official hinted that an upcoming government report on UFOs will include information that cannot be easily explained. There are instances where we don't have good explanations for some of the things that we've seen, and when that information becomes declassified, I'll be able to talk a little bit more about that, former director of national intelligence John Ratcliffe told Fox News' Maria Bartiromo on Friday. Ratcliffe said some UFO sightings have been declassified in the past, but a report to be released by the Pentagon and other federal agencies will present more information to the American people. There have been sightings all over the world, Ratcliffe said. And when we talk about sightings, the other thing I will tell you, it's not just a pilot or just a satellite or just some intelligence collection. Usually, we have multiple sensors that are picking up these things. Ratcliffe said elements that are hard to explain in the unreleased sightings include movements that are hard to replicate or traveling at speeds that exceed the sound barrier without creating a sonic boom. The report is expected to be released on June the 1st, Bartiromo said later in the program. Yo, this is crazy to me. Like, this is some actual news. This isn't just some random person in West Virginia with three teeth that's all outside of a Waffle House. <laughs> like, this is real. This is a former top national intelligence official saying that this report that's about to come out contains a lot of stuff that we don't know how to explain. What do you guys make of that? Well, I know Bethany's feeling on UFOs and aliens in general is a, a strong cat. Strong cat. I'm going to have to say more so than Bigfoot. More so, whoa, more so than Bigfoot. More you think so it's okay. more Bigfoot. plausible than Bigfoot? No, I think it's less plausible. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. See, I'm team alien. Like, real talk, uh, of all the things that we talk about on this show, in this segment of the show, a lot of them are pretty tongue-in-cheek. Uh, I just think that the universe is so big, the chances that we are the only intelligent life in all of existence, to me, is just like... I just don't think that, that there's a good chance of that. Like, I think there's probably someone or something else out there. And uh, there's been a lot of reports like this. This actually, if you remember, this was a part of the COVID relief package. That It was like written into the bill that as a part of the package, uh, the, the government had to declassify what they knew about UFOs. Like somebody just wanted that in there and it got in there <laughs> and it got passed and we're going to find something out. I don't know what. Yeah. We're going to find something out. It's going to be interesting. I think... 
I mean, actually, the the way that they're releasing it probably bothers me the most because I feel like right. if if there was nothing to it, they would just throw it all out there and just be like, okay, is this what you wanted? And I I'm guess? sure it's going to be heavily redacted. Mm-hmm. And but I mean, look, there's only three possibilities with this stuff that people. I mean, there's so much that people are seeing. There's only three possibilities, right? It's our own government doing some type of testing with aircrafts and technology that we're not aware of yet in the public. That's A. Option B, it's someone else's government. Mm. Or option C, it's something that we don't have our minds able to wrap around yet. And, uh, I mean, any of those are on the table. They're all possible. Um, But I think option C is just as likely as the other two. I I have to throw in an option D, that it is some some natural part of the universe similar to meteors or asteroids that we may not have yet discovered. That's true. It could be something like that a lot of times as well. Um, or, Or, and I'm just throwing this out there, it could be... That former President Bill Clinton is leading a conversation about empowering women. Could be. Could be. Could be. What's more likely? There, there are stranger things. <laughs> Strange, <no. laughs> there are stranger things. For our last story tonight, we're going to dip into the world of conspiracy theories a little bit. And we're going to talk about all the conspiracy theories about the disappearance of Elisa Lamb at the Cecil Hotel. This is something you guys are familiar with, yes? Yes. Yep. Uh, have you have you seen the Netflix show? We have. Okay. Is it worth watching? Would you recommend it? I would recommend it and say it's worth watching. As any documentary, you will find some biases in it. Sure. However, I find the story to be very disturbingly intriguing. Yeah. It's on my list. Like, I want to see it. I love that kind of thing. It's like a mixture of true crime and conspiracy. So, it is right up our alley on In the Shed. Um, I haven't seen it yet. I do know about this story. I've read about it a little bit. Um, So let's get into it. Netflix is known for its true crime dramas and documentaries, and its latest drop, Crime Scene, The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel, examines the disappearance of Canadian student Elisa Lamb from the Erie Cecil Hotel in Los Angeles. The 21-year-old was on her solo travels when she visited downtown L.A. in January 2013, where she stayed at the notorious Cecil Hotel. After a murky past involving untimely deaths and housing serial killers Richard Ramirez and Jack Unterwerger, the hotel had tried to reinvent itself as a cool destination for young people on their travels. But when Elisa Lamb disappeared from the Cecil Hotel, failing to check out on February 1st, 2013, the ugly head of its somber past was reared once again. Police released a CCTV video filmed inside one of the Cecil Hotel elevators in which Elisa is seen behaving very unusually. The elevator doors don't close for several minutes, and the young woman appears agitated, jumping in and out of the elevator as if she believes she's being followed. Then she disappears out of shot. Tragically, Elisa's body was found inside one of the water tanks on the roof of the hotel 19 days after she was declared missing. By this time, all eyes were on the case. The video had gone viral, and internet sleuths had caught on to the case, trying desperately to uncover the truth. As a result, and egged on by a number of unusual coincidences, several theories emerged about her death, ranging from the possible to the downright bizarre. Have you guys seen the the uh, the CCTV video footage of her in the elevator? We have. It mm-hmm. is a part of the Netflix documentary, and I have to say, it is very odd. I watched it today. It's disturbing. It's it's weird. It's weird. Like she does look like she's afraid that she's being followed, or that she's like tripping on something. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. I don't know. I mean, I know uh, she she had some some mental struggles, uh, some struggles with mental health, as most of us do in some form or another. Hers might have been a little bit more extreme, but something was happening for sure. Mm-hmm. The video is disturbing. Um, so, what were the theories about the disappearance of Lisa Lamb? Let's talk about a few of those. The first, she was murdered. The unusual nature of Elisa Lamb's behavior in the CCTV footage from the elevator initially led people to believe that she was murdered, perhaps by someone not caught on camera. Elisa's body was found naked, which led to suspicions of foul play. It was also noted that the lid on the water tank was closed when detectives came to investigate the discovery of her body, something which would have been very, it would have been very unlikely that the young woman could have done by herself when she climbed into the tank, considering the distance between the water level and the lid. However, in the Netflix documentary, the hotel maintenance worker who found her inside the water tank 
claimed that the hatch had been opened and that he actually was the one to close it after discovering her. Despite this, some online theorists even went so far as to accuse a specific person of being responsible for her death. Morbid, aka Pablo Vergara, the founding member of a metal band, had uploaded a video of himself inside a room at the Cecil Hotel just a couple of days after the body was found. And that video was a teaser for a new music video entitled Died in Pain, which featured lyrics referencing a woman drowning in water. Some amateur detectives online believe this was too much of a coincidence to pass by. The allegations of murder against Morbid became so intense that he went on to release a video at the time proclaiming his innocence, insisting he had been in Mexico recording an album at the time she went missing, which was true. Years on, the singer told Netflix documentary makers he had suffered mental health issues as a result of the incessant accusations laid upon him. I received death threats every day. There was no escape. I tried to take my own life, and I woke up in a psychiatric hospital, he said. Uh, so what do you guys think about this one? I don't really know if it qualifies as a conspiracy to say that she was murdered. Um, I think that's a distinct possibility. Like when you find somebody with those circumstances, that's just a likely possibility. Um, but as far as it goes, the accusations that the singer of the metal band Morbid was responsible for her murder and her death... Uh, what do you think? Is that likely? Is that possible? Do you throw that one out? We have to throw it out. He was proven to be in Mexico at the time. The video that was recorded at the Cecil, I believe, was proven to have been recorded maybe a year prior yeah, before really. Lisa was, even came. Some... Yeah. Um, I, I think that Morbid is another victim here because these internet sleuths are ruthless. They True. don't always consider the evidence and True. they have gone to make his life miserable. Yeah, yeah. people believe of, what you want, what they want to sometimes, you know? Yeah, a lot of people, I don't, they don't understand the, the sort of theatrics and, you know, the costume of really heavy you know, black metal. Sure. So they, some people see that, and they're really thrown off by that. Yeah, And then the yeah. lyrics on top of that... That was just, I, they make connections that aren't there. That was an unhappy coincidence, right? Yeah. yeah. And I yeah. have to say that the mur murder in general is a distinct possibility here. If you watch the footage, like you said, it does clearly appear that she is afraid of something. It does. Whether that be another person or, you know, some something involved with her mental health issues. For sure. Uh, there's also weird contradictions about the lid of the water tank and I just find it hard to believe that she would have even in her severe mental health issue been able to get inside it and then close it yeah so there are many things that bother me about the case it honestly bothered me from the start to think about a 21 year old woman traveling overseas alone yeah especially one who her family was aware had extensive mental health issues. it's a sad it's a sad Sad case for it's sure. Very sad. It's sad all the way around. The second option, uh, one possibility she died as a result of suicide. Upon discovery of her body inside the water tank, it was considered whether the young woman may have purposely tried to harm herself. The coroner ultimately ruled this out, stating that uh, it just wasn't a likely circumstance for her to be able to take her own life uh, and be found the way that she did. Can we all agree that this is something that it, there's just... Uh, not to not to be uh, punny, but it just doesn't hold water. Yeah, I mean, I, if you look at the history of the Cecil Hotel, uh, the amount of suicides there are pretty staggering, and it none is. of them were done that way. True. There's so many different and, ways. And the the hotel, to be clear, the hotel has a dark history. Very, like, very. There's strange. a reason why people <laughs> consider it one of the most haunted hotels in the world. Because a lot of bad, bad things, evil things have happened in that place. Like, for sure. And probably in most hotels, by the way. Probably. probably. Yeah, I would have to say it would be a very odd choice of suicide. It would, for sure. So, right, so far, we're throwing those two out. Uh, here's another option. Someone from the hotel was in on it. This theory was derived from the eagle-eyed viewers who noticed a discrepancy in the time displayed on the CCTV footage of the young woman in the elevator. From the 2.30 mark, that's 2 minutes and 30 seconds of the video, Elisa d disappears out of sight, but the footage keeps rolling. Zoning in on the timestamp on the video, people noticed it was quite blurry and suggested that it had perhaps been tampered with, eliminating up to 53 seconds of film. Others suggested it had been slowed down at points to edit parts of the video out. Um, so this kind of suggests, this theory suggests that uh, 
somebody from the hotel messed with the footage to cover up a crime. Um, from your viewing Netflix uh, documentary series, from what you know, what do you think about that possibility? I can't completely throw this one out, and here's why. While I have not been presented with evidence to confirm this theory, I do know that, as you said, that the hotel was struggling because right. of previous events. For sure. In addition, there were two ways that Elisa Lamb could have gotten onto the roof of the building. One way was through a stairwell that was supposed to have an alarm to alert the front desk any time that someone reached that staircase. However, it they cannot say for sure whether the alarm was working at the time or if it went off oh, that for real? night. Am uh, I correct in, not, in saying real? that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think this, that's what I, they I said. I missed the that. I missed that, yeah. Mm -hmm. The other possibility is that she climbed a fire escape up a fire escape to the roof, wow. which does not seem likely to me in the mental state that she was probably in at the time. Right, right. So I do think it's possible that the footage could have been messed up by security at the hotel in a final attempt to save their name. The LAPD also stated on the documentary that no one in their department has messed with the footage, that they have watched it extensively, but that they do not know how that could have occurred. And I, for one, have complete faith in the LAPD. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think uh, I think it's, it's uh, possible somebody from the hotel had more knowledge about it for sure. I mean, she was up there for 19 days before she was found. Um, somebody, knew, somebody knew something. I mean, no matter what happened, yeah. accident, murder, somebody knew something. So I think there's some... There's something to that theory, at least. And the yeah. numerous reports due to the water supply from residents saying that the water was brown, it is very hard for me to believe that no one in for maintenance days. at the hotel for 19 days, for days visited the water tank to determine the quality of the water. Hello, front desk. Our water is brown. Okay, let me go to the water <laughs> tank. It makes... Yeah, So I, I think it's possible there was a cover-up to keep the hotel from being found liable for this young lady's death. Definitely a possibility. There, I mean, there's a very obvious section at the end of that CCTV video where the frame skips because the door is not... I mean, the door is wide open, and it skips, and immediately the door is closing. It's mm -hmm. sort of like already started closing. Right. So there's, there's this weird jump. Where there's clearly at least a second or so missing. Something is missing. Yeah. For sure. And for sure. everybody says they haven't touched the video. And it's very ob obvious. Somebody's touched the video. It's true. And, you know, I don't know if that was to protect whoever originally posted it. Yeah. Maybe they blurred the timeline to mm. obscure some events of... But it is crazy. It's weird. It's weird. It, it is weird. And the documentary makes it clear that at the time that Elisa Lynn was at the Cecil Hotel... Part of the hotel was being used for living arrangements for some pretty shady characters. It was mm. known for drug use and suicide and homicide. And so it's very possible that they could have been protecting someone inside that hotel. Yeah, and especially, like you said, um, ultimately to, to keep from being liable for her death. I mean, for sure, I could see that being, being, uh, being what happened, at least, at least in part. Um, so two more theories we want to cover. The next one, her death was a copycat of a film. This is when things get a, a bit far-fetched. Uh, Webb Sleuths investigated the case quickly, uh, began drawing comparisons to the horror film called Dark Water. In the film, the body of a girl is found in the water tank on top of an apartment block after guests noticed the water looked dark and tasted funny, which was exactly why and how Elisa Lamb's body came to be discovered. The girl's name in the movie was Cecilia, which is pretty close to the name of the hotel, in this case, the Cecil. Uh, some people entertain the idea that perhaps Elisa's death was a result of someone trying to create a copycat of the film in real life. Um, that's crazy. Is that not weird? It is very weird. There are very odd coincidences in both between the movie and her death. It is not common that someone's body is found in a water tower. Not at all. On top of a hotel. Really, yeah. And the fact that they, they were discovered, they discovered the body in the exact same way in the movie and in real life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, personally, I don't think that that's what happened. I don't think it was a copycat. I don't buy that as the answer to the riddle here. 
but it freaks me out. Yeah, the the synchronicity there is word I mean, of the day. Yeah, syn- synchronicity for all of you paranormal. Geeks. Also, a great a great <laughs> metal band name. I like it. Synchronicity. Like the sin synchronicity. Ooh, Ooh, that's good. So yeah, the synchronicity there. So this, you're talking about like a Japanese novel that was written, I think, in '91. It's crazy. And then. You know, there was a Japanese movie made of that, and there was an American da- adaptation made of that. Crazy. And then ten years after that, you have this maybe murder, maybe suicide, maybe accidental death. Just that just almost a, exactly mirrors it. That's like Inception level layered. <laughs> yeah. It's so not, the odds of that being being a copycat are not great, but also the odds of of it being that close, resembling the the book and the movie that closely is is. They're not good odds either. And this is where these two conspiracy theories combine because some people have gone as far as to say she planned a grand suicide that would copycat the movie and that is how she chose to end her life. I hadn't even heard that one. Now that, to me, that is more likely than someone copycatting it and murdering her. The fact that she could have been uh, familiar with that book and just been in a mental state where she just couldn't take life. I mean, that's to me, that seems more likely possible... And I had never heard that one. That's a good one. Thanks for bringing that. Uh, the last one that we want to consider, she was a tuberculosis test study. Here's where we go really rogue. The online communities investigating Elisa Lamb's death noticed that there was an outbreak of tuberculosis in Skid Row, which is just a few blocks from the Cecil Hotel, around the time that she went missing. Their attention zoned in on it even more when they discovered that the test for the specific strain of tuberculosis going around, was named, I'm not kidding, the Lamb Elisa, standing for words, big words, lipo, arbonone, amandamam, enzyme, enzyme linked, immunosorbent, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, literally her name, Lamb Elisa. That is a. It's spelled just like it. That is a weird coincidence. It's very strange. Con- <laughs> conspiracy theories jumped on it, speculating that Elisa may have been being used as a biological weapon of some kind to help eliminate the homeless population in the area. Fuel was only added to the flames when it emerged that she was a student from the University of British Columbia, which has a notable tuberculosis research center. It was suggested that Elisa Lamb may have been executed by whoever had plotted to use her as warfare, perhaps after she learned too much, or something like that. Needless to say, this was not a primary avenue of investigation for the LAPD, but her autopsy did reveal that she didn't have any signs of tuberculosis at the time of her death. What do you make of that? It is a crazy coincidence, I will give you that. And the fact that it has an acronym still doesn't make it. That spelled her name. It spelled her name. Exactly correct. Her name. However, I would like to think that if this were the case, someone would have been smarter than to name this strain or test something other than her name. Okay, that's a good point. <laughs> that's a valid point. So yeah. I have to throw this one point. out. I think it's a little bit too far fetched. It's it's again, it's a very interesting synchronicity. It is. But I I mean I think like. Her her parents were were on the documentary. Her her sister, I believe, and this, I mean, she clearly came from a family. They named her Yo, Elisa Lamb. They have her sister on the documentary. I think I think her Whoa. sister was on there. Well, I gotta watch it. Her That's, family man. was part of it, although I don't think that they were specifically interviewed. They had to. They, be, no, they did not talk. Yeah, they had to be they, hard though. Yeah, they, just they, they did show them and sort of. Wow. They were there in the states. Yeah. So for, this this for like solidarity. this is fun to think about in the sense that like you want to figure out what happened, but then you lose track of the fact that this is a real person that you know. Yeah, it's, very real. It's a tragedy. Her, her it's death a tragedy. was very tragic for. For those that love her. I, I think this outcome is too too perfectly science fiction. Like this would make a great movie. Like this one. Yeah. But it is weird. It's strange. It's like even thinking back on it, I'm like, this is the one that kind of stumps me a little bit. Yeah. Like how do you explain the fact that it was called <laughs> the Lamb Elisa and that she is from a university that specializes in studying tuberculosis and that two blocks from where she died, there was an outbreak of that same strand of tuberculosis that has the same name as her. It's crazy. It's weird. It's cuckoo. It's bizarre. <laughs> I don't think that it explains everything, but it's weird. And we can't explain it. 
So the question is, how did she really die? What really happened to Elisa Lim? What is your what is your final word on it? What's your best guess? What is your opinion? Uh, what what do you think happened to this poor girl? Yeah, without without getting too much into it, and I don't know if we want to spoil the documentary for anybody that hasn't seen it, but your call. Yeah, my my best guess would be accidental death, accidental, accidental. drowning. Do you think that she just went for a swim in the water tank, basically, and was I, high or drunk and drowned or something? I I think mentally probably not able to make the best decision a, a really good decision about where she was and what she was doing gotcha. we do know from the documentary that she was had stopped taking her medicine prior to arriving in la that's an important thing to know and that medicine is not one that you can just stop without yeah. the side effects making her condition for profoundly sure worse. for sure it doesn't matter if it's uh, medicine for mild anxiety or depression if you take medicine like that, you can't just stop it cold turkey. Like you gotta wean yourself off of it because it's changing the the brain chemistry. I'm I'm no scientist. I'm not a brain doctor, but that's what I have heard. The um, only way I think the accidental death is feasible is if she did have a mental episode, which could be supported by the elevator camera, and she could have seen things that were not there, and in an attempt to escape, wound up on the roof of the Cecil Hotel, possibly to hide in the water tower, and maybe could not get out of it. That's deep. That's deep. However, I still just cannot make up my mind about this one. I, th- I think we can't throw murder off the table either. Do- let me ask you this: Do they make, do they make a definitive statement at the end of the Netflix documentary? You don't have to tell me what it is. Do they make a definitive statement on what they think happened to her? Yes, they do. Okay. The police have come out with what they think happened. Well, I'm gonna have to watch it, and uh, maybe after I do, we can talk about that on the show. Email us in the shed with Wes at gmail.com. Let us know what you think happened to Elisa Lam. Uh, I tend to think murder. I mean, like, my mind naturally goes to the fact that something bad happened to this girl because how else do you end up in a water tower on top of a building for 19 days? Um, there's just too much there. I think this, the, the, there's foul play involved. Uh, I do think, like Russell said, it's possible that this was an accident. But uh, if, if it was, I think that there was a, a group of people involved that maybe they were uh, swimming or they were being goofy or they were hanging out after a night of partying or something and, and a, a mistake or an accident or something went wrong and and people panic when things go wrong yeah. and, and maybe they just fled. I think that's possible. And here's I think, an, go ahead. I think even if it were accidental death, uh, the hotel is liable. Absolutely. For the fact that absolutely I mean, they they state that there's graffiti up on the roof, which means people go. They up were there aware. All the time. Oh, they yeah. were aware. There, there was were, a problem there at there the hotel. There were beer cans left. It's yeah. Clear evidence of people. I do think it's also a possibility that she could have been afraid of someone right. possibly wound up on the roof, or right. she could have been up there partying. Maybe somebody threatened her in some way, but the and weird, she wound up in the water. The though. weird part, the weird part. I mean, a lot of it's weird, but the weird part. If she was up there, we, we almost all everything that we're saying, all of those scenarios involve her not being alone, other than there may be suicide. There's someone else there, someone that knows something at least. Or something paranormal, if you believe in that. True. But in the video of her on the elevator, we don't see anyone else. But it could have been tampered with. And maybe it was. I think maybe it was. And there are, as we have said, two ways to get on the roof. True. I do not believe in her current mental state and being a slender, smaller woman that she the fire no the escape fire is, escape is out. She is didn't go out. up the fire escape onto the roof. I don't think it, so. It, the the picture of the fire escape is I mean it's like a straight up ladder right. with no yeah I saw that today. There's no no, uh, no, no guardrails, sa- no safeguards, no or safeguards. Anything yeah, for like twenty feet. Yeah, there's no way. <laughs> it's, there's no it's way. I'm not scary. I'm not doing it. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not scared to death. It's of not there's possible. no way I do it. So. Whatever happened, uh, we're not sure. It's still a mystery. The Netflix uh, series uh, is recommended by both Bethany and Russell. I'm going to check it out, too. If you've seen it, email the show. Let us know what you think. Uh, But we can all agree that something happened that was tragic. Um, Something happened uh, that 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 poor girl in in her young life did not deserve that snuffed her life out early. And uh, and it's one of those things that that it's just going to be a mystery 
um, until someone who knows something speaks up. And there's got to be someone who knows something, whether it was an employee at the hotel or someone knows something. Someone knows something. And her parents deserve answers. They deserve answers. That's all for this week. This has been our longest episode ever. And it's no coincidence that it's when we've had guests. We've been waiting to have guests here in the shed, the beautiful, awesome shed. Uh, Bethany and Russell, I've had a great time hanging out with you guys, talking with you guys. Uh, thank you so much for being the first guests on our show. Thanks for having us. We've been honored to be here. Peace out, War Eagle. War Eagle. So this is uh, episode 10, so we'll have to have you guys back again, maybe at another milestone episode. What do okay. you say? Sounds good. Cool. That's all for this week. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. I can't either. It's back in the house and out of the shed for me. Thanks again for listening to episode 10. Make sure to subscribe, like, share, and review. It really does help. If you have any paranormal experiences, opinions about sports or politics that you'd like to share, you can email the show at intheshedwithwes at gmail.com. Again, that's intheshedwithwes at gmail.com. I might even read it on air. Look for us on Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Tune in again next week when we'll hit the headlines, investigate together whether or not the Wizard of Oz set was haunted, and talk some sports as well. This has been In the Shed with Wes Anderson, the best news show in the land covering politics, sports, and the paranormal. Have an adventurous and fulfilling weekend. I'll catch you tools later. Peace out, Boy Scout. Meemaw, we made it!